Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, to Wider UK. We are like really pleased to to host uh, the government of Ukraine uh, Autonomous de Madrid. Several members of the, the government. We hope we have we have an insightful and productive session. The idea is to keep a very intimate and informal conversation about what uh, makes uh, London, uh, what puts us in the top position in the startup ecosystem in Europe. So we brought here um, several members of the ecosystem with different perspectives. And the idea is to share their, their thoughts uh, about what makes this successful, what could be done. Read and two learnings uh, from the development of the ecosystem here. Uh, so we are ever hosting this event at uh, Wider UK. So Wider is uh, part of Telefonica. We are the innovation arm of Telefonica. We are present in most countries where Telefonica is present. Uh, present. So we have, well, in addition, go London hub. We have hubs in Madrid, Barcelona, Munich, uh, São Paulo. Bogota and, and Buenos Aires. And we exist, our mission is to connect Telefonica uh, with innovation coming from startups. And, and generate impact. In the, in the business. We do that by uh, promoting internal uh, innovation and transformation, and digitization in a way, new revenue streams, for, uh, for the business, but also identification of future future trends and uh, cultural change. Typically, we uh, identify needs in the business. We scout companies, the best solutions, the best startups. We support their relationship with uh, with Telefonica, and then we will back at it. Because we are present in many ecosystems across. Uh, across Europe and across uh, Latin America, I think we are in a very uh, 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 interesting position to see the differences, the development of these uh, ecosystems. In fact, a lot of our companies in other regions, they uh, think uh, as the UK is kind of a stepping stone for their international expansion. Uh, they come here for investment. They come here to uh, establish a presence in, uh, in English-speaking uh, markets. Uh, over time, and what we'll discuss today, the UK uh, government has implemented a series of initiatives to make the UK a very attractive uh, a place for, for startups. And the results are quite interesting, quite impressive. So if we look at like last year, uh, UK startups raised $30 billion in investment. Uh, France, 15. Uh, Ger Germany, 11. And Spain, 3.7. So it's a big uh, difference in scale to, to all other ecosystems in, uh, in Europe. There are uh, 122 unicorns in the, uh, in, in the UK. Uh, last year, there were uh, in total 2 million vacancies in the, in the UK ecosystem. So it's a big uh, uh, war for, for talent uh, as well. And when we look at in across Europe, London is uh, definitely the first uh, a C team for, for startup investments. Uh, Paris is the second. Uh, we, in Spain, Barcelona is the ninth, and Madrid is on the 15th position. So there is a big uh, gap, but also fantastic opportunity, right? And then one of the things we'll, we'll discuss today is that there are several challenges in the in the UK right now, several several challenges. So that can also be an opportunity. Uh, so to, to give you a, a good overview, and 
and also the possibility to do some deep dive in, in some of the the topics. Let's say a half an hour panel um, with kind of more of an overview of why the UK is, is successful. And then we have 40 minutes, 45 minutes of, of Q&A, the opportunity to ask questions and deep dive in some of the the topics that we discussed today. So uh, we have here in, in, in order uh, Daniel Glazer, who was the uh, London, uh, London Office Managing Partner at Wilson Soul City. Daniel is an American tech lawyer. And since 2010, uh, Dan has apprised high growth UK and European technology and by size business on the Israeli capital in the US, in the UK, and Europe, and also expanding their business in the United States. Uh, Jean de Fouberon was a man to father, father and founder at Ascension Ventures, and has uh, more than 30 years of experience working in technology, innovation, and venture. He guides Ascension team in all their investment decisions and also supports their portfolio to scale. Dr. Mike Short, who is the Chief uh, Scientific Advisor at the Department of International Trade. Uh, Mike has been 30 years in telecommunications uh, with Telefonica and has joined the, the Department of International Trade in 2017. He leads the science and engineering uh, profession in the department and ensures uh, that its policy is informed by the best science, engineering, and technical advice. Uh, we have uh, Christopher Sisseni, who's the head of intelligence at Cyclades, the most important tech publication in Europe, backed by the Financial Times. Uh, the Cyclid Intelligent un Unit has the mission to provide to uh, to the, the, the European uh, ecosystem with insights and, and, and trends that we can And then uh, Ricardo Varela, the CEO at Localistico. Ricardo is a Spanish entrepreneur that has chosen the UK to start his company. And he can kind of provide uh, interesting comparison between the two countries. Thank you very much for, for joining us today. Um, <coughs> Perhaps I will start uh, with Jan. Uh, what, what factors do you think differentiate London versus the re rest of Europe from, from the beginning? Thanks for that. Hello. Um, so, so there are many, when you want to create kind of a, a tech ecosystem, I think there are many, many factors to put into place. So I think early on the, the UK government introduced um, some, some tax incentives um, called Enterprise Investment Scheme, um, which really helped, uh, I guess, de-risk um, high net worth um, individuals that, that live in the UK um, and getting them to you know, start acting like angel investors and start to invest in innovation. And if they did that, um, some of the, they could offset some of their income tax um, against that. And, and that started to really build, I guess, a broader base of investors and, and angel investors in the UK, like you might see in the US, in a, that happens in a more kind of natural way. So I think, you know, that was a key factor of kind of broadening the investor base and, and getting people to take more risk early on. I think the second factor, um, which is important for any ecosystem, is, is recycling entrepreneurs. So if you look at the West Coast of the United States, you, you had, you know, a lot of tech companies started there 20, 30 years ago, and as those companies exit, those founders and other people from that company set up, um, you know, new companies um, with the experience of having been through, you know, a startup to exit cycle, and and those people um, start to help build the ecosystem. So I think that's the second key factor. Um, third factor is. Um, I would say accelerators and incubators early on, um, like Wire is one of the first, and you have Techstars and others. They're very good at kind of aggregating um, mentors and investors and 
industry players to, to kind of come around and support and attract entrepreneurs to that ecosystem. And, and that was kind of early on 10 years ago that there were quite a lot of activity in that space. And then obviously London, you know, is a financial center, fashion center. Um, so there are a lot of um, talent that comes out of those companies that can start startups, but also if you're a startup, your, your customer base is basically at your doorstep Whereas the U.S., you know, is is much more distributed between Los Angeles might be the media center, and New York could be fashion and media, San Francisco's tech, London it's kind of slightly centralized here, um, which which may be similar in Madrid actually, which is a benefit to to allowing those companies to scale. Um, and then I mean I could carry on, but uh, I think that those are some of the key factors. Um, and obviously the English language, I think, helps as a hub for. European talent that wants to break into the North American or US market. Um, it's a good bridge between Europe and North America. And I would say the similarities with Madrid would be as a bridge between Europe and Latin America, which is a massive market. Um, but I think I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you, Jed. Mike, would you complement the type of vein in Edwards, what made the UK uh, uh, successful? So I agree with everything you just said, but a few additions. Um, so I've also been a vice president of Telefonica and I'm on the board of Innovate UK as well as being chief scientist within the UK government. So I bring that broader perspective, not so much from the investment angle, but more from the tech end. I would suggest the UK government support for innovation, science and technology is very strong. Uh, it's increasing its percentage of public money that goes into science and innovation. Uh, UKRI, UK Research and Innovation, is a key vehicle for that, whether it's support for universities or for the innovation system. Roughly $10 billion a year is spent for the UK as a whole, so that's a large sum of money. Some of it goes into universities for research, but also some of it goes into the innovation ecosystem. And in terms of Innovate UK, that's roughly $1.2, $1.3 billion a year just on innovation for startups and scale-ups, and that's been very helpful very helpful during COVID. Lots of ideas came out as to new ways of doing things during COVID. I'd also highlight that the university system itself is particularly strong. You know, four of the top universities in the world are in the UK, and that is a great feeder for both talent and innovation. And what always surprises me is that some of the great Spanish universities don't seem to generate as much in the way of research papers or um, startups as the UK ones do. Uh, so when thinking about the levers you have in Spain, actually using those strong universities more fully for innovation, talent and scale-ups, I think is quite important. I'd also add to the accelerators that have been covered, I think we've got lots of multinational headquarters companies here in the UK that have been attracted to the UK for all sorts of reasons. And if we look across many sectors, we can see it in pharmaceuticals, we can see it in automotive, we can see it in aerospace. We can see it in electronics, we can see it in lots of areas and lots of sectors. Some of those big companies, those big corporates, are multipliers of innovation. It's not just the role of government to do it, it's also the role of business to do it. And I was fortunate to be involved with Wire since the very beginning here in London. You know, you've innovated as well, but with the backing of Telefonica, this is your third centre here in London in barely 12 years. You know, that's a sign of innovation within Telefonica. But I think finding ways of getting cities to work with other cities, accelerators to work with accelerators, is a great way of thinking about scaling up. Because I think the innovators largely want scale up where they can cross borders. So it's not just a question about thinking about one city, it's how can cities work together. And lastly, to finish, from a trade point of view, uh, we're taking out over 100 UK companies to Mobile World Congress next week. Yeah, it's been a busy week this week, but next week will be even busier. And the reason we have over 100 UK companies is that it's the major event in Europe for digital. Uh, it's in Barcelona, of course, but not Madrid. However, Madrid could benefit from things like that. It's, it's a great opportunity for collaboration and innovation, hence the number of over 100. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I mean, we mentioned some of the things the UK I mean, has done and implemented. Uh, Daniel, from a US perspective, uh, has the UK done better or worse? Or was it more government-led? 
corporate that how how would you compare the two the two country yeah i think what what we've seen happen in in london um there's a couple of things that are different different than the u.s first of all it's much more government-led than in the united states the united states is lo largely that the growth of the tech ecosystem since the the early to mid 60s in the valley has largely been the story of of, of private capital pri private companies um whereas uh, certainly as, as an american coming into this ecosystem one of the great uh, distinctions differentiators was the role of government in sort of sparking the uh, i think uh, what eventually became more more private capital in the ecosystem but what i think is particularly interesting is how quickly london in particular mirrored the silicon valley story accepted it in a very short period of time, relatively. So one of, the, um, one, I, one of the statistics I find most striking about the London tech ecosystem is that in 2010, which was the year of the launch of the Tech City Initiative by the Cameron government, the total venture capital investment into London technology companies was $100 million for the full year. In 2021, which was the high water mark, it was $25 billion down to, I believe, 20 last year. It's part of the global slowdown in, in, in venture. But at a, at a peak of 25 billion, 11 years after the launch of the Tech, the tech City Initiative. And if you look at, at what happened between late 2010 and 2021, and to pick up on what Mike and, and John said, um, I think a lot of it was accelerated initially by SEIS and EIS, the, the, the government incentives to bring in um, to bring in pri private capital into startups, as well as other incentives such as patent box and, and, and the like. Um, accelerators certainly helped, but then what, what, what really then sort of allowed it to build on itself is that the more you, that you had stronger seed-funded startups due to the accelerators, due to SEIS and EIS incentives, that led to the creation of a whole range of Series A funds to invest in those seed stage companies. And if you go back to 2010, 2011, companies were leaving London to move to the US, not because operationally it made sense, but because they needed to raise later stage capital. And by, I would say, 2014, 2015, 2016, those companies were staying put unless they had good reason to expand. And really, it was expansion not moving to the US at that point, because there were a whole um, generation of homegrown um, UK Series A funds. Right. And then what then built on top of that, and this is how I believe that we've got to 122 un unicorns here, is that, you know, I often say that as a rule of thumb, seed is local, A is regional or national, and B and beyond is global. So then that next generation of companies reached Series B, and that's when the, the American funds start, started coming in. And now I think the most recent statistics I've seen are something like 65%, 70% or so of all Series B and later capital comes into UK companies out of the United States, right? And, and to, to get to that point where we were 100 million annually is basically a standing start in 2010. To get to them in 25 billion in 2021, which ranked it, I believe, the second or third largest tech ecosystem in the world, London that, that is, that accelerated the growth of the valley in what took the valley 30, 40, 50 years and did it in, in, in 10. Um, and yeah, and, and now London is is one of the great ecosystems of, of, of the world. So, you know, I, I see it as very similar to the U.S. in the respect of, of, of having a, a fully formed seed through growth stage <coughs> ecosystem. But one thing, and, and this is maybe for another, it's another topic that it is very different though than, than the U.S. is that we still haven't seen the exits here that we've seen in the U.S. and that'll be the next part of the story. So, thank you, uh, thank you, Leo. I think that uh, uh, leads to uh, an immediate question to Ricardo. Why did you start your company in London and not in Madrid? So, well, in, in my case, we, I was already here. So I happened to have been working here in London. I were previously in the US and here. And uh, in our case, London was kind of easy to create. So creating a company in the UK is really, really easy. Paper-wise, you don't see it as a big, hustle to basically get it done. And also our partners were here, which is what we mentioned before about industry in a certain location actually helps people be there. So in our case, we work with Google, with Facebook, with Apple, all of which have headquarters here. 
So for us, the easier way was our clients were here, our partners were here. It was easy to create. We created here. Um, however, we have, for example, a, a subsidiary in Madrid, and um, that has been really helpful through, for example, Brexit, because we could innovate some of the contracts to a European kind of capital, so we could actually deal from there. And we have employees, obviously, there. Spanish labor law is slightly more complicated than UK labor law, so it was kind of very useful to actually have an office there as well. So we started here because it was like the easiest thing, and when you start, you really want as easy as possible. But then we saw some other benefits, I think, that have been mentioned here. I also think that apart from the tax incentive and SEIS, CIS, the part that I wanted to bring along as kind of more the grassroots kind of smaller people or entrepreneurs is that there's also a cultural thing and a networking thing that comes with it. So I think the UK not only has, like now in Spain, we have a startup law, which kind of gives us also some of those tax incentives. One of the problems that I think the UK has that Spain doesn't have is people like Sean, for example. So the idea that some of these investors into those new tax incentives may not be that sophisticated, right? And UK is more sophisticated. Generally, angels come from having done companies previously and things like that. So you have access to a network of people that can help you in those first steps. And I think that's important because one thing is money. The other one is how do you use it, right? And I think that's something that in Spain, culturally, we haven't yet been able to do. And it's very easy to access here in the UK. Like I've been, you, you can sit with Mike and he would tell you about what he's been doing. I've been in several sessions with Daniel explaining about the US market. That is something that I think actually from the community of Madrid could be worked on. It's like, how do we create those hubs in that network? <coughs> which I think was easy for us to kind of get access to when we started. And I think that helps you succeed like. Yeah, I mean, I, I have that perception that the, the ecosystem here is quite open and quite a kind of embrace the, 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 the differences and welcome a, a lot of people. From the research uh, at Sitbit, uh, Chris, what, what insight, insights can you, can, can you share on how to attract this uh, entrepreneur or how to create this uh, 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 environment that Ricardo mentioned? So having the privilege of going last, I'm going to default to taking the contrarian view just to make it a bit more fun for everyone in the audience, but also because I believe. Uh, Ricardo hit the nail on the head. Why did you start your business in London? Because you were here. Uh, that is almost always the case. Whenever we ask entrepreneurs, why did you start your business anywhere? The answer is always well, it's just where I was. And then the average age of a successful entrepreneur is 42. So we like to sort of idealize the college dropout Mark Zuckerberg type profile. That's the minority. That's why we like to make movies about it. Most people have at least 10 years experience in an industry. Uh, they see a better way of doing something or an opportunity. They take the risk and they go for it. And that's how they become one. You know, in their late thirties, early forties. So I actually think the question is not, how do you attract startups? Because at the age of 42, most people are fairly well rooted. They have, homes and families and friends and lives wherever they are. And no matter how good a tax incentive might be, it's very hard to come away from one of that and uproot your family and move to a country where you may not speak the language and not know anyone. So the question becomes a little bit more, how do you stop those people from leaving? And so my colleagues to the left represent very well the structural advantages that this country has. It does have a favorable policy environment. It is a very good investment environment. And it has a very strong evil and tax environment that is very much in favor of taking risk. You know, if you do well in this country, you get to capture a lot of the, the upside from that, at least in comparison to many other European countries. Um, so the question then becomes, how do you attract the sort of person that goes on to start a business and how does that journey start? So if, you, if you're starting a business in your early 40s and you've been working throughout your 30s, what took you to a place? Well, probably the graduate job market, right? And then what fed into that? It comes back to your educational opportunities. So I think this whole journey really starts around 18, 19. Uh, if we're talking about undergraduate levels or people that come on for graduate when I was in their, in their early 20s. Um, and so once those people are there, you need to have the support infrastructure to nurture talent, to keep them motivated, to give them career opportunities in the sectors of the economy that are more favorable to tech-based innovation. And so really, I think this starts much earlier on than how do you get startups to join. 
there is the, the very valid point of scaling up. And, you know, London is that bridge between the rest of Europe and the States. The language thing is real, time zones, all of that, 100%. But I think that then becomes a little bit more of a question uh, of how do you encourage scale-ups, at which point, once you are a growing company, you might be more inclined to set up a subsidiary or a second location based on that kind of business environment. <laughs> the, the point of inception uh, almost always comes back to wherever those people happen to be. So it starts much earlier. That's my kind of general. I mean, uh, would, would the question be as well, how to, in addition to how to attract these people, how to incentivize these people that at the age of 42, they leave their jobs and start a new company? So of all the entrepreneurs I speak to, uh, I feel like they just have no choice. Once people get it into their heads that they see a business opportunity and that they have that kind of risk profile, there's nothing that's going to stop them. So then all of the things we discuss, all the favorables in this, in this country or the city, become the sort of hygiene factors that stop people from leaving. But if it is impossible to actually start a company, raise investment for it and hire the talent, then yes, people will leave. Um, so then that comes into, you know, how do you spot people leave it rather than how do you get them to, to come in the first place? Yeah. Even, given that uh, uh, scenario, I think the question, and maybe uh, for you, uh, uh, Daniel, what would be the, the goal of supporting the development of the tech ecosystem? This, what, what, what is, it, is it important and what should be the, the ultimate goal of it? I think it's hugely important to determine what, what the ultimate goal of the ecosystem is, right? It can't just be, um, you know, attract talent or nurture talent or incentivize talent, right? To build companies. Well, why? Right. What, what, what is the ultimate benefit of, of, of that? And, you know, and I think back to, again, I'll, I'll go back to the beginning of the, the Tech City Initiative in late 20, 2010 or so. And I think looking back on that, what was particularly interesting about the, the government incentivizing uh, and make, maybe making it easier to build tech companies was, you know, if, if we, we, we recall, that was sort of the, the, the tail end of the, the financial crisis, the 0809 financial crisis. And, um, you know, thing, things were um, a little, little challenging around Europe broadly at that time. And I think um, what the government seized upon, and I think that, that this, was, this, this was pretty smart, was that there was a way forward to, to build a sector of the economy, the digital economy, um, you know, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an economy that maybe the long-term jobs and traditional sectors weren't there as much as they were. Um, and building up a new sector of the economy, or, or a, a nascent sector of the economy, um, and ultimately getting to a point where, where you create sustainable long-term job growth, sustainable companies, which has benefits to the whole country, right? Which uh, stronger communities, um, a better overall standard of living, quality of life, et, et, et cetera. And so, you know, if, if a goal of the ecosystem is, is to create long-term sustainable businesses, which creates, let's say, an overall stronger economy, stronger communities, quality of life, I think that is an, a very admirable goal of a tech ecosystem. However, I think it's important to understand, certainly from a government standpoint, when you're incentivizing um, the creation of a tech ecosystem, is that part of what often sparks that is bringing in venture <coughs> capital. And the goal of venture capital is not to create long-term sustainable businesses. The goal of venture capital is to maximize the returns for professional investors, largely to the extent of pretty much anything else. Okay? And early in the growth of an ecosystem, at the early stages of, of companies, those interests, creating long-term sustainable businesses, and the, the goal of long-term traditional US-style venture capital are pretty much aligned. But as the later stage that you get, they're not necessarily aligned, right? Creating a long-term sustainable 20, 30, 40 year old business, um, right, with that, that employs lots of people and is a sort of a pillar of the community is an admirable goal. It is not necessarily the same goal as investing $10 million and wanting to see a $3 billion exit within the 10 year time horizon of the fund through an IPO or a sale, right? Which is, all, and there's no judgment on, on one outcome or the other, 
But I think it's important to recognize that those aren't the later stage that you get, that those aren't necessarily aligned outcomes. And, and to think through when, you know, what are the long-term ramifications of the incentives that you're creating, both for the companies to build and for investors to come in the outside is private capital and investing. What would, would that mean that the, at the beginning, if it wants to uh, stimulate the creation of a technical system, we have to start from early stage company. Is that an implication of what you just said, or? No, I, I, I think that there's, there's, there's different ways to, to build an ecosystem. I mean, you could literally start from the ground up, which I kind of feel that, that the UK did. You could also create incentives um, for, for more mature businesses to move there. I mean, there's plenty of, of for example, US states and, and major cities um, that, that create substantial tax incentives and other incentives for high growth technology companies to, to, to move there, right? For the, for the benefit of, of the local residents and you know, creating high growth te te technology jobs. And those, those cities and states aren't looking to attract early stage startups as, more as, they are, as, as much as they are, let's say, more mature scale ups or even um, you know, public or, or late stage pri pri private companies. I mean, I wouldn't, and I wouldn't say that they're looking to build any more or less of a tech ecosystem than, than let's say, a, a government looking to incentivize really safe startups, but it is different, right? So again, it, it sort of goes back to what is the ultimate goal that government is trying to, to achieve by attracting tech companies, and then maybe reverse engineering it from, from there, which is um, how, do, how, do, how do we reach that point B from, from, from the point A? Yeah, so good, good point. You mentioned uh, tax incentives, uh, Jean. I think everyone did at some point mentioned tax incentives. Yeah. Uh, so, a question uh, for you, Jean, is as a very active in, in investor in that like, particular uh, uh, um, uh, topic. So, how important do you think was the tax incentives, EIS and SEIS, developing the UK ecosystem? It's like one more was like a crucial. Uh, actor. Yeah, again, if you compare it to the U.S. and and the wet, like the U.S. personality or or I guess like the high net worths or investors there kind of tend to do invest naturally, maybe because they were tech founders or they were part of a tech tech team. I don't know. They're they're on the eBay team, so I don't. It seems the U.S. didn't really need. Um, tax incentives to get people to invest just because they're a bit more frontier um, mentality. But whereas Europe, more conservative, I would say, continents of Europe, um, people with wealth are even more conservative than, than um, UK people. But yes, I think it was critical in, in bringing, I would say, because 10 years ago, there weren't a lot of exited tech founders in the UK, right? So a lot of the wealth was from hedge fund managers, people that worked in the city that some of them wanted to be active angels and some of them um, had wealth, but, and then there were fund managers like us that would kind of give them a portfolio of EIS around a qualifying company. So I think it was critical in, in broadening out that investor base that didn't really exist because you hadn't had a generation of tech exits and, and those people coming through. Um, and the incentives were quite complex in the sense that you, you can get 30 to 50% of your investment out um, on investment through your income tax. You can defer capital gains tax. If the company fails, you can get more tax back um, on the loss relief. If it exits, um, it's capital gains free. So, that, so there are kind of four or five elements um, that really helped build that ecosystem. But just, can I just add something to Dan? Like I think if you do have a scenario where, where you have a $3 billion exit and let's say Apple buys that and that company kind of disappears, I think um, the result will, you'll probably have 10 individuals at that company that weren't the founder, but maybe were head of product or CTO um, that will have made some money through their option schemes and will have learned how to go from a startup to an exit. And those people will either you know, invest in the next generation of founders or start their new company. So I think even in the scenario where it exits and it seems like that company's disappeared, um, a, a lot of angels will have made money from that and they'll recycle that into the ecosystem and that team, um, the 10 or 20 key people from that team will probably go on and, and fortify the ecosystem as well. So I think it's critical in having that recycling and 
if Ricardo exits his business, like, will he stay in Madrid and become an angel, um, or will he come back to the UK? That recycling is fundamental, and if you look at the early days of Brent Hoberman coming back in, the SCAC founders, that was pretty key to building the ecosystem. Thank you. Uh, you yeah. Actually, a uh, comment on that, so making it actually more explicit to Spain. Actually, there's, uh, I would recommend that you talk with somebody called Manuel Mates, which is from Big Sur Ventures. He's done actually some studies about this that we're talking about, like the waves in an ecosystem. So how many, he's called Manuel Mates, and the found is Big Sur, Big Sur Ventures. And he's done these presentations about the waves on an ecosystem. So how many rounds of like exits and new founders have to have before you have a developed ecosystem where Spain is right now based on those exits and the fact that it's not only founders that exited a business and then start the next one this has already happened actually in Spain like you have there's a famous article about the 20 mafia which you probably know like after Telefonica bought 20 all the people that were at 20 that was like their first kind of real it actually U U.S. kind of influence because Tarin is from the U.S. I guess part of the founding team was from the U.S. And then that, that was the way of working that they had it to start in 20 was what then took people to do other companies. So that is already happening in Spain. It just takes many waves. And one of the things that I wanted to add to this is that I think we forgot to mention like the good parts about Spain, which is as opposed to other ecosystems, people want to go back to Spain. So at some point, your people want to go back to live in Madrid. You want to go back to live with your family. You want to enjoy, like, have you seen this? <laughs> <laughs> so you want that, right? So that doesn't happen in many other ecosystems. Like, you want to go back there, right? So I think it's taking advantage, as, as you very well said, is not really start more. It's just don't make them fail, right? Like, as long as they want to stick there, it's going to happen. And then on infrastructure and others, Madrid is amazing. Like literally you can be in two, as you said before, like, no, that's from Barcelona. It doesn't matter, you can be in two hours in Barcelona. You want to earn a half in, you know, in two hours in the beach in Malaga. Literally Spain is one kind of connected thing because infrastructure, and that has been something that in the government did very good. And we have to probably take a bit more advantage of, right? So I think those waves are what actually has to be happening. Uh, the, the question then becomes how to attract back these people that want to, to go back. Like there is a big uh, uh, community of uh, uh, Spanish founders in the UK, for example, and I suspect in, in other countries. Yeah, but I think, for example, one of the advantages that I think we have on this is more like what Christopher said, like try not to frustrate people that are trying to do it. So it's more how do we make it easy for people to do this, right? So things like we obviously have more cultural problems right now. So for example, what we were mentioning, the tax incentives and how we work in the US, a lot of things that work in the U.S. and the U.K. won't work in Spain. Spain is not that type of country. We are not that type of political system. If you try to do something that is major tax rebates for a lot of things, Spain has really high unemployment, most of which is not going to be people that are going to start startups. So is, if there was going to be some tax incentives to something, it would be probably on those industries, not on startups. But if we left like some, some gaps here and there so the startups can do something, people will go there naturally. Like I think I spoke with some of my fellow Spanish founders that we have companies either here or in the US. I think most of us will want to go back at some point. And that's the whole thing. Like you don't even have to fight too hard for it. People will go back. So the idea is more how do we then make sure that when they go back, there's actually enough of an ecosystem to sustain them and to allow them to then grow, right? That's more the thing. Yeah. We have now regulation in Spain about this. It's not like a CIS, CIS, but it is something. It's what, like again, this is a good example actually to look at, like how much effort and coordination it took to kind of move the startup law in Spain versus how it was in the, in the UK. But it's something. It's there. It works. And again, as Christopher said very well, it's not because you have more, uh, it's easier to start in a place. You start where you are or where you want to start. It's more how do we make other things simpler? Like for example, now that this startup law is out there, how do we make sure that people know? We have a, an Invest in Madrid kind of committee. We don't have that well a Start in Madrid kind of committee. It is more like we have the investment arm. Now we work on getting people to kind of do projects, right? And for me, that starts with simple things. Like one of the things that nobody mentioned here was gov.uk, that marvelous website where absolutely everything is listed and that makes everything so simple. Like, this is how it is. Have you tried gov.uk in Spain? Like, have you seen, like, have you tried to hire somebody in Spain? 
you know about convenience and all these things that don't exist here so for us is is something one thing is simplify the law which is what obviously all the parties are trying to work some of the parties are trying to work on the other one is make it make people know about it so again is for example the role of having advisors like what you provide is not that they make the law simpler is that they just tell you oh maybe we should do this do this do this and then there's some complications going on right that's what good lawyers do that's what good advisors do that is another way to actually foster an ecosystem. We cannot always simplify the law, but we can make it simpler for entrepreneurs to understand what to do. I'd like to be a bit more directional, if I may, on the non-financial incentives, not investment areas. I think some entrepreneurs find it very helpful to have open debates about data strategies, access to data, looking at data sharing, looking at data innovation, looking at access to data as a strategy. Um, the London Data Store actually helped to generate large numbers of apps and systems that are now used right across London because of setting up a London Data Store. To me, having a data-centric stra strategy would be a very logical thing for Madrid to do, to keep the talent in Madrid, but also to attract talent to Madrid around data analytics, data visualization, data development. Secondly, I think using the corporates that are already large in Spain and making more of them from an innovation point of view, having an active dialogue with the big corporates in Spain to say, how can we get you to do more innovation in Spain? What would help you if we swept this away or swept that away? What would encourage you to do more from a corporate multiplier of innovation point of view? Some of them have actually bridged across from Spain to the UK or Spain to USA, because they can't do some of the innovation in Spain they would like to do. So I think engaging with the corporates in Spain is a natural multiplier. And thirdly and lastly, I think the links between Spain and Latin America should be a really strong card. You've mentioned the number of uh, immigration uh, immigrants to Spain. You've mentioned also the talent that that brings with it. But actually, in the same way as the UK has exported to the world through the Commonwealth and before that through the empire, you know, you have a major diaspora that would be really useful as a gateway in and out of Spain. And if it's not done from Madrid, why not? You know, it seems to me such an opportunity to scale up with Latin America that you have more than other countries. Uh, yes, other countries can try it, but I think why not grab it while it's there? So in summary, a data strategy, use the corporates as multipliers, and use the advantage of Latin American mix. Well, that helped me years, of course, for that. One of the things I think London did particularly well uh, relates to working with, with corporates and, and not messing it up uh, is in the financial sector. Yeah. So obviously we've got the, the city of London here. The FCA actually played a very strong role in setting up the sandbox, which allowed fintechs to play and not be regulated too early on. Uh, and I think as a large consequence of that, Norman has become the fintech capital of the world, um, even more so than any individual place in the US. And that is quite impressive given the, the scale of it. So giving people the flexibility to, to try and fail and not get involved too early on from a regulatory standpoint is definitely something that works really well here, uh, particularly with we'll And I don't know enough about the economy of Madrid, but I'm sure there are some sectors with the strong and this actually, I had a point about this, which is actually Madrid has like Comisión Nacional del Mercado de Valores. We happen to have actually a really good infrastructure for fintech in Spain. Like you can emulate a lot of the, for example, right now we have things like CapChase in Spain, right? Like for loans or for securitization or for all these things about cryptocurrency right now. Spain has a really sophisticated system for actually this. It's just that it's not that well known and that we assume that it's more comp again, it's, it is more complex, it's less accessible but we actually could be playing like that. You can do structures like you can create in Luxembourg, you can do those in Madrid, and you have really the, the commission there, which I'm pretty sure would be, would love to get a call from you because they don't get that many calls. So is that thing that I think could be one of the strength points, for example, very similar, it's like FinTech or securitization could be an area where we can play. You actually have people already doing this. So only Chris Carrascosa, which is very famous like Spanish lawyer, she does a lot about cryptocurrency and she's actually one of the people like her business trying to help people set up those things. Um, there, there are actually examples of this. So for example, FinTech would be one of those sectors. It's how do we identify the areas where, sadly, maybe our legal system or maybe there's other attractors other than 
just incentives. Yeah. Yeah. Is is it the the case of then selecting a a hot sector to invest on? What's your take on that? But oh, I have strong views on this one as well. <laughs> um, you see it a lot with regional development, or however you want to phrase it, that uh, people try to pick sort of sectors that they want to specialize in and attract talent towards. I don't think you can really play that game unless you have a very long-standing competitive advantage in an area like finance in the city of London. Because by the time you set up all these programs and you find out how to streamline things so that people who look at their views something go to leave, whatever the hot sector of the day is that you've planned for might not be the, the hot sector. And that, that is a big problem with the, with the venture capital world. Uh, and I think Dan's point of, you know, why do you want to encourage this in the first place? Uh, it's not the most efficient industry. You know, if there are easier ways to create jobs, if you look at the money that, that gets put around, I mean, it's not the most efficient way to to funnel it through private asset allocators who take fees off the top and then, you know, back nine out of 10 businesses that will go bust eventually and about 50% of the money is going into local real estate. You know, that's good business to be done, uh, but it's not the most efficient way to create jobs, I don't think. Um, there's also a whole thing about most of the kind of SaaS infrastructure is American-led, so... There's a sort of, I think, scandal waiting to, to come out of the works of how much public money has gone into uh, funding investments into early stage companies and a large proportion of which has gone straight back to big American listed corporates and that in the form of their hosting fees and, and that kind of thing. Anyway, I'm, I'm getting off the point here. Um, you mentioned blockchain. I think a lot of places were competing to become the blockchain centers of whatever region. Um, how that plays out, I, I don't think we'll know yet, but, but crypto and blockchain is definitely not the hot sector of the moment. So there is a risk that anyone who overinvested in attracting crypto entrepreneurs, laid infrastructure uh, that might ne not be used to its full potential because right now the, the gen AI hype has overtaken that. And in six months, the way this industry works, it will be something completely different. So I think there is a, there's a risk there of if you're trying to pick sectors that you really want to focus on, unless it's something really long lasting but you have a heritage in there's a risk that you sort of end up chasing something you can never really catch but too. thank you thank you I, I have one last question and I, then i would like to kind of open for that one more questions but uh, mike you i mean you've been a long time with telefonica and then uh the part of international trade so you probably have uh, a view of the main differences between london and madrid or the UK and Spain that probably are interested to me to do this diplomatically, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Candidly. Can I say there is no shortage of talent in Spain? You know, clearly there's unemployment, but there's some very well-educated people in Spain. But I don't think they always travel well. So, whereas the Brits, I think, travel a bit better. You know, it may help with the English language, it may help because of historical links, but uh, the travel side, the, the talent side, I think has to be a comparison. I think also the approach that the UK has to business is much more international and scalable. And we think about international and scale much more fully than many Spanish companies do. I often observe Spanish corporates as being cautious. Maybe there is a reason for that. I don't know what it is, but, but I think they are very diligent, but often cautious. Um, I'm not sure the British companies are quite as adventurous as some American companies. However, relatively, I think we're a bit more adventurous than I see for some corporates in Spain. I also think we tend to build on what we've got more readily. So when I look at uh, overseas offices, you, you could often see British corporates working with other British corporates overseas. So it's not just dependent on government. You can see networks such as chambers of commerce that are very active overseas. Uh, you can see embassies hosting events for better networking. You can see mechanisms being used both within the UK and internationally, which seem to be richer in some cases. I was speaking to a, a civil servant last night who is now in the Spanish embassy in London, uh, but was in the Beijing Spanish embassy for Spain. In, and he can see a world of difference between the way the British diplomats work in different countries compared to the Spanish diplomats. So I think there's a lot of talent you could leverage, but it needs to have a more international and scale outlook 
than I, I than I think I see at the moment. Telefonica are adventurous. I'm not knocking Telefonica. They were very insightful when they set up Wire here some 12, 14 years ago. And actually, it's been quite a success story. But I think now the innovation flows across international borders so much more quickly. Mobile is the world I know best. You know, it's a global supply chain. So thinking internationally from the start is quite important, not as a last resort or city by city. Yeah, one of interesting points. And then there's, uh, as we've mentioned here, uh, and perhaps in Spain and Madrid has a very uh, interesting position as being this uh, a springboard for the Spanish-speaking markets and the uh, globally, right? So yeah, I I would like to open for have more more questions because I mean definitely we will keep going for a for a long time here. I would like to see UK-based accelerators working directly with Spanish-based accelerators. Mm -hmm. I think Wire is one example, but you know maybe you should talk about how how you work with Madrid today. But it would be very sensible to have innovation bridges between the UK and Spain. You have certain strengths that the UK does not have. Maybe maybe Spain could learn from the UK strengths through a bridge. Think about a bridge which is more sustainable. But maybe you should talk about London, Madrid, and how Wire works. We, yeah, we we work kind of very 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 closely. Although in most cases, it's uh, uh, more kind of Spanish companies try to expand into the UK than the other way around. That's what we see, and they 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 come here mainly for initially mainly for investment. But I think having an investment, uh, 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 having more investment available in later stage investment available in the UK helps uh, that a lot but we see also a lot of kind of business business development opportunities so company that want to, to establish a presence here uh, we we've seen obviously some cases on the on the on the on the other direction um, which what I don't see uh, enough and I, I I think we could see a lot more is um, Latin America companies expanding into Europe through Spain and and the other way around. I think that link is uh, it's not not uh, not strong enough at the moment. We've had for over 10 years a better regulation executive in government. <laughs> That's mainly to sweep away red tape. That was inspiration for us. <laughs> well, I, it still has more work to do, but it's to sweep away red tape. But I think the definition of regulation you gave to me, I would also say, are the regulators that you have in telecoms or in energy or in transport, are they pro-investment or just dealing with competition policy? Most of them have been set up to deal with competition policy to make sure the market is run fairly. But actually what you want is a pro-investment regulator, a pro-innovation regulator, as well as one who keeps the market tidy. I'd also say that the role of government in procurement we haven't mentioned today, <laughs> but the goal of government to not only run the country involves a lot of spend. And actually, the innovators benefit a lot of time from procurement that is more pro-innovation, pro-investment. So actually thinking about the role of government in procurement, I think, is as important as regulation. But to me, I would be doing three things. Looking at better regulation to remove red tape, looking at regulators who could be more pro-investment and pro-innovation, and looking at procurement more precisely. And lastly, a lot of the systems are old fashioned because they haven't been brought into the 21st century. They're not digital. Some of the references you made to some of the perhaps old fashioned systems that weren't really up to date or digital. We've changed a lot of our systems in UK government to be more user-friendly and more digital. So how do you update the systems to be more pro-digital and ready for the 21st century? Yep. So from my point of view, I think also Comunidad de Madrid can do only like certain things across the whole framework of Spain and our complexities. Uh, but one of the things that we're focusing a lot, I think, on the macro stuff, which is like tax incentives and so on. Like, again, that requires a lot of work. Just look at how much until we got a the startup law, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of cycles.
but there's a lot of things that can be done on the micro level, which definitely can be done even in Comunidad de Madrid only, like things about you know, creating sites that actually help with that communication. Uh, we were talking about how do we foster networks like we have here in the UK. There's already networks working in Madrid. Like Madrid is one of the places where Google set up a Google campus, which we already have. Uh, there's an association of entrepreneurs already existing called Chamberi Valley, which is a group of people that are first, second, third generation entrepreneurs that you have there. Is how do we make that easier? Because that for me is the micro level about how Spanish people are and how we have to make policy for Spanish people. Like in the UK, mm -hmm. in the same as like if the US is positive like around here, in the UK people are around here, in Spain we're definitely like positive like around here in terms about economics and everything related to that. Like we don't talk about our salary, we don't talk about a lot of things. Some of our laws are actually made like that. Like for example, you mentioned like how laws transmit information to the, to the citizens, right? Like in Spain, we have a lot of laws about not paying minimum wages, for example. Like literally, the way that you pay a salary in Spain is this is the minimum, and then let me give you something on top. You cannot set a salary. So even that indicates that we are, we think a lot about our laws for the worst case, not so much for the best case. And I think that is a bit problematic as well, but that is macro that translates into micro, translates into culture and how we operate. For me, it's something that Comunidad de Madrid could do is actually one, foster initiatives that already exist, things like Google Campus, things like Seed Rocket, things like um, Chamberi Valley, any kind of already group of people that basically we're going to secretly, because again, I'm from the government, I'm here to help you, as you know, very famous <laughs> saying, it's more like, okay, we're going to kind of support this, but it doesn't have to be an initiative by the government. It's like a grassroots initiative that just happened to happen in the community that we can kind of foster. And then from the government, we can definitely work into communication because as we said, if you had like the right network, like we, we, ha we have a session actually as one of our investors, even with the framework that the UK has, you still need a lawyer and you still, it's an agreement like this thick before you kind of sign something in the UK. But it's different if you've got somebody guiding you through how is it going to be. And I think is that that's the part that in Spain is very difficult. Like a micro is not about collaborating on a business level. We're very good at personal relations we're not very good at collaboration at the business level. And I think that is something that also could be fostered, could be communicated a bit differently so that people, as we said, people that want to do a company feel like they can, not like going a bit against this traditional Spanish mentality of no, we cannot, like that doesn't happen here. And no, it also happens here. For me, that is communication that could also happen. I'll add one thing very quickly. You mentioned the worst case scenario. Uh, and I think there is a big role of the plate to stay of the state in providing that social safety net and a sort of counterfactual example of the UK American model, which is sort of, you know, that you don't get that much support, so you might as well, you know, you've got to go find another way to work and, and get economically active. There is another way, which is the French model, who have been fantastically successful in really funneling state support into kids starting a, an ecosystem. And there's this joke in, in France that one of the biggest investors or support uh, systems for entrepreneurs in France is the social security system, the chômage in France, where I'm not 100% sure, but I think you get about 80% of your salary for about two years time. And there is a, a huge amount of uh, people who've used that unemployment benefit to start working on prototypes and MVPs and, and launch businesses. So I don't know what that social safety net looks like in, in Spain, but I'm an Austrian uh, citizen and sort of what I see from a lot of other European countries is they fall a little bit between the two stalls of the very sort of you're on your own Anglo-centric model which encourages you to keep working and, and innovative, innovating whatever it is and the French model where you have very good support so you're sort of encouraged to take your time and come up with something what I see with other European countries is you, you get just about enough that you're a bit comfortable and you don't have that drive to go immediately back to work or not quite enough to fund a, a future venture but then that's I don't know enough about the the Spanish world also. Yeah, uh, it's just an idea I just had now, but we've been talking about like startups and incubators, and I think there's another looking at Madrid and some of the benefits. So think about a scale up, okay? And think about the fact that you're part of the EU. So imagine you had an accelerator. So this is um, focused on, I don't know, European scale up. So a scale up, if you think about a, a life journey of a company, they raise money in their local company, they grow, they get product market fit in their market, and then their first thought is, how do I expand? So imagine if Madrid 
set up a, an accelerator, so a scale up, and you're starting to take the top 20 SaaS businesses in Europe. I'm going to give you a home for a year in Madrid. I'm going to give you a million pounds each as part of a funding round. I'm going to do deals with the local um, corporates, telecoms, fashion, that are going to help innovate and potentially become your customers. And then I'm going to give you a bridge into Latin America. So in Mexico, I'm going to have corporates. And you have a whole program around helping people scale into a new market, Spain, and then into a new continent. And if you can attract the top, I don't know, 20 scale-ups in Europe to come to that program and have talent and people you know that they could hire locally that kind of skips that first three years of a, of a journey and potentially creates jobs educates your local ecosystem in a different way than the incubation way and in a way that could be quite easy to control because it'd be a few corporates buying in government and then getting some some South American partners so just you know you skip um, that incubation stage possibly Yep, no. interesting. One, one angle that we didn't discuss, and we may just uh, build on uh, what uh, Rodrigo mentioned as well, I mean, Madrid's looking uh, for London as example. Uh, there are certainly things that were done here that did not work well, right? And those things are usually not very well advertised and are forgotten, and we, you don't find a lot of information on that. Uh, any Anything that you would highlight on that area, the things that were done here and shouldn't be done elsewhere, that did a bit of work out there. Is this where we finally get to talk about price? <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to sound like a broken record, but on the talent pipeline, uh, this streamlined new movement of, of people coming to study and work in the UK, I think it's played an oversized role in this ecosystem. Since Brexit came into force two years ago, the number of European foreign students coming to study in this country has dropped by 50 percent. Uh, and going back to what I was saying about the long talent pipeline, we won't see the implications of that in this talent ecosystem for about 10 years, because those still graduating now ha have come in from from all over Europe. And so that, of course, is a huge opportunity for for other centres of of great education and, and graduate job prospects to to capitalise on. Uh, so I wouldn't, well, this is partially something I saw with the government, or partially something driven by the private sector in the UK, is the glorification of American venture capital. Um, and and actually how it's uh, completely ill fit for purpose for many UK companies that actually take it. Because most classic Silicon Valley venture capital views the world as for every 10 investments, Seven are going to fail, two are going to, as they say, watch their face, uh, and, and one is going to return the fund or more. They're running science experiments. Um, and they, what they're looking for are outliers who are willing to work 24-7, 365 for the next five or ten years to focus on two goals and two goals only, mission and money. Change the world, whatever it means, in the context of their business and money. Make as much money as possible for everyone around them, management, founders, their employees who are all motivated by employee options, um, and the VCs. And when push comes to shove, I don't think that that's what drives most British companies. Um, and increasingly, I think the later stage they go, there's a realization that there's a disconnect there. But I do think that that has started from a place of glorification of American venture capital as seen as the, the, the zenith of what a, a company can accomplish here is to raise from top tier US VCs which may be the right answer for some companies, but is not the right answer for all companies. And early on, some of the, the enterprise investment scheme, what, what we're calling EIS, um, it was kind of tax, it was classified as tax avoidance. So if you are looking at um, tax laws, um, you have to make like a lot of it was home finance and it was a bit not really driving innovation. So you gotta make sure that um, the rules of who qualifies for like, tax breaks as a company is kind of really, you know, driving whatever you want to drive, but innovation into the choice. Can I just say this is not so much an experiment, but I think it's an observation. Um, I'm not sure countries always get the importance of scale. And if I think about have universities spun out enough ideas yet for scale reasons, I think the UK still got some way to go 
you know, we're pretty good at feeding the startup uh, pipeline with talent, but also ideas. But I think from a scale point of view, it's not at the scale it needs to be. So I'd say it's not so much a failure. I, I would say it's a journey that the universities are on. And I think your universities need to catch up with that. You know, how can they think about scale of their ideas <coughs> when it comes to impact in the marketplace, not just in Spain, but internationally? How can they really scale up? So I think that's something that the UK government will work on. Uh, it's already starting to comment that some universities are trying to hold on to too many assets inside a university, which affects the funding of those ideas. Uh, there needs to be more of a review in that area, it's my personal view. Um, and, and that is to help scale up some of these better ideas from universities. The universities have a great role in terms of teaching and research and some enterprise. That enterprise needs to be full weight within the university system. Yes. So some universities, if the spin out, I say they are on 13% of the, yeah. the spin out, some 10, even in the UK, the university owns 50% of the spin out. No angel or VC or any of the best in that. So you just bring till now where we have to go back to that Northern US EP university and we've been down to reality. But that's there's not a sad to think even the UK, so I imagine it's saying it may have been sad. It is or even worse. Or even worse. <laughs> and that innovation, nobody will invest in that because you want the founders to have you know, a part of the business or the out. Which is that key Silicon Valley mentality of everyone understanding is more valuable to have a thin slice of a huge pie than a large chunk of a small one. And that is one of the key things that holds back most European ecosystems. I should, whether it's the universities or the founders or wherever it might be. Sorry, I'm pointing at you. I'm border, borderline accusing you of things I know nothing about. Um, but you know, there is that, there is that mentality of, um, you know, it's my company. I, I, I start itching when people send us pitches at Sifted of which we get maybe a hundred a week. So <laughs> let me tell you about my startup and I am so-and-so. And then by the time you understand what the business actually does, if you've read the whole person's biography and it's very much about the individual and that doesn't encourage scale uh, very well. Yeah, and on that, I wanted to add also that, for example, something you can see from how the US does stock options to how the UK does stock options to how Spain is going to probably do with stock options is that now we have a regulation that makes it very tax nice, whatever. Again, this is the macro versus the micro. Like I think macro, we already got regulation. That's excellent. From that until somebody in Spain considers that stock options are worth anything, a bit, right? Like some years, like we are different culturally. So one of the things that I would definitely recommend is that remember that we have to do our version of this, right? Like the US works into venture capital particularly, but venture capital as Daniel was pointed is we are putting basically a rocket ship into something and we're launching in a certain direction and we don't care if we crash it against the wall. Spanish culture in general, not so, a bit more risk averse, let's say. So the UK is like, you know, again, US, UK, Spain, right? Like our risk aversion is a bit bigger. So it's like, how do we make that into, it's going to require us like at least a couple of waves of people making considerable exits on something, which again, we put the regulation there is going to be better tax wise, but we still need people to benefit from that before they consider. Because if I ask my employees and I ask employees of one of the companies that we have subsidiaries there, if you ask cash bonus or stock options, cash bonus all the way, right? Remember also we're one of the few people like no UK person ever on an interview asks about holidays. Spanish people all the time, literally all in the interview for a startup. So, sorry. First, second interview, okay, and then holiday-wise, yeah, and I think is is that part about how do we make that fit with our labor market and how do we make that fit with the type of person that, again, this is not for everybody, because something we have to attract, but I think in Spain also remember that one, not every company that we start is going to end up being Series B venture capital, we're like much, actually, or our business uh, environment is like smaller businesses, right, people have less than 10 people per company, that's the majority of companies in Spain. So probably we'll start like that, and then there would be some people that would work differently. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I think we, yeah, unfortunately have two, two, two clouds, but I think really inter interesting uh, remarks and, uh, and learnings. So a lot about simplification, a lot about communication, uh, a lot about having a clear view of uh, what we want to achieve, and uh, a lot of examples of actions that, uh, that could be taken. So thank, thank you very you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you.